My village lies in the shadows of Chomalongma, Mount Everest. The train can take you there, but be warned. Those attempting to reach the summit must face him. Expedition Everest, Legend of the Forbidden Mountain, is a cutting-edge, highly-themed steel roller coaster located at Disney's Animal Kingdom. The attraction first opened on April 7th of 2006, and thrills millions of guests every single year. Riders climb into steam locomotives and journey up and through the Forbidden Mountain as they trek towards the Mount Everest base camp. But guarding the Forbidden Mountain is the mythical Yeti, and riders spend the rest of the ride attempting to escape from the Yeti and its path of destruction. Being a Disney roller coaster, Expedition Everest was not only built with a ridiculous amount of theming, but was also built to handle an enormous number of riders every single day. In this video, we will be covering the history of the attraction, its effect on Disney's Animal Kingdom, what went wrong with the infamous Yeti animatronic, and just how crazy the day-to-day -day operations of the ride are. Before we get started, if you guys wouldn't mind hitting the like button, that would be greatly appreciated as that helps the channel greatly against the YouTube algorithm. Alright, let's dig in. Warning. Some viewers may be too lame to enjoy the following information. In my last episode of Problematic Roller Coasters, I covered the first roller coaster built at the Walt Disney World Resort, Space Mountain. When Disney World first opened with the Magic Kingdom in October of 1971, the resort had no thrill rides. Wet Enterprises quickly responded by adding Space Mountain to the Tomorrowland section of the Magic Kingdom. Disney would continue to expand the Walt Disney World Resort, and they did so by not only opening more hotels and expanding the Magic Kingdom Park, but also with the addition of several new theme parks. On October 1st of 1982, exactly 11 years after the grand opening of the Magic Kingdom, Disney would open Epcot, the second theme park at the Walt Disney World Resort. The name Epcot is an acronym, which stands for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. While Epcot differs greatly from the original version that Walt Disney had for the park, the version of Epcot that we have today is still spectacular and remains one of the world's most attended theme parks. Following the addition of Epcot, the resort would continue to expand, and on May 1st of 1989, the property would see the grand opening of its third theme park, MGM Studios, which now goes by the name Disney's Hollywood Studios. MGM Studios controversially opened just one year earlier than Universal Studios Florida, which opened its doors on June 7th of 1990, just 20 minutes down the road. MGM Studios was built around the idea of a show business pavilion that was originally planned for Epcot. The show business pavilion was supposed to feature a ride called Great Moments at the Movies. At the time, Disney CEO Michael Eisner liked the idea so much that he felt the ride could lead an entirely new theme park, which led to the decision to build MGM Studios. MGM Studios opened with only two rides, the Great Movie Ride and the Studio Backlot Tour. Overall, the park was horribly flawed, and many guests were disappointed by the lack of other things to do. Disney has basically been working to fix the park since it opened, and the original rides the park was built around have been removed. How ironic. Disney would continue into the 1990s, and further attempt to make the Walt Disney World Resort the true one-stop destination for all Florida tourists. The resort now featured the Magic Kingdom, Epcot, which featured an aquarium larger than that of SeaWorld Orlando's, and even their own movie theme park to compete with Universal Studios. The only thing left was an animal theme park to compete with Busch Gardens Tampa. With the goal of 100% control of Florida tourism, Disney set out to do just that, and began designing the concept of their animal park. Originally, the prospective name for the park was Disney's Wild Kingdom, but due to a trademarking issue with the Omaha Insurance Company, the name was scrapped. This would lead to the name evolving into what we know today, Disney's Animal Kingdom. Leading the design effort of Animal Kingdom was former Disney Imagineer, Joe Rohde. The new Animal Kingdom was to focus on three broad classifications of animals. Those that exist in today's reality, those that did exist but are now extinct, and those that only exist in the realm of fantasy. The park would feature different lands to make this possible. Exhibits devoted to real live animals would be built in the park's Africa and Asia sections. Dinoland USA would be an entire park section devoted to dinosaurs, and Beastly Kingdom would be the section devoted to creatures of both legend and mythology, good and evil. The original plans called for leaving major thrill rides out of the Africa and Asia sections to avoid disturbing the live animals. Beastly Kingdom was planned to fill the void of a major thrill ride by featuring Dragon Tower, an indoor dragon-themed roller coaster. 
The area would also host Quest of the Unicorn, a walkthrough unicorn attraction, and a Scottish enchanted restaurant. Unfortunately, due to budget constraints, Disney chose to delay construction of either Dinoland USA or Beastly Kingdom to a later phase of expansion. The company ultimately chose to build Dinoland first, as they felt they could use the area to help market their 2000 animated movie, Dinosaur. This meant the brand new Animal Kingdom Park would open without a major roller coaster. At the time, Universal were busy themselves preparing a new theme park to partner with Universal Studios Florida. Universal Creative would end up recruiting the Disney Imagineers who had worked on the Beastly Kingdom area. These former Imagineers would take Beastly Kingdom and reimagine it as the lost continent for Universal's Islands of Adventure. The Scottish restaurant became the Enchanted Oak Tavern, Quest of the Unicorn became the Flying Unicorn Roller Coaster, and Dragon Tower became Dueling Dragons. Islands of Adventure would open just one year after Animal Kingdom. Disney's Animal Kingdom would open its doors on Earth Day, April 22nd of 1998, becoming the fourth theme park at the Walt Disney World Resort. The park became an instant smash hit, and attracted 6 million visitors in the 1998 season, followed by 8.6 million in 1999. The park was performing better than Disney had anticipated, so attention was given to the resort's other parks to help them compete with the new Animal Kingdom. This further delayed the addition of Beastly Kingdom. However, for the 2000 season, attendance at Animal Kingdom fell to 7.7 .7 million visitors. It was also evident that guests did not see the park as an all-day destination and would only stay through the morning until early afternoon. Disney quickly looked to see what they could do. Imagineers hoped to add a major roller coaster to Animal Kingdom, but the park's original plans for the Dragon Tower roller coaster were tied to the unbuilt Beastly Kingdom area. At this point, Universal's Islands of Adventure was well known, and it was obvious that the Lost Continent was strikingly similar to the original concept of Beastly Kingdom, and that Dueling Dragons was strikingly similar to Dragon Tower. Thus, building Beastly Kingdom and Dragon Tower would have been completely redundant, and Imagineers would need to come up with something new. Despite this setback, designers still hoped to incorporate a creature of fantasy into whatever would be the new ride. The Imagineering team quickly got to work under the lead of Joe Rohde as they put together the story of Animal Kingdom's next major attraction. The team agreed upon a roller coaster themed around the Yeti, a mythical ape-like creature that in Himalayan folklore inhabits the Himalayan mountain range in Asia. On April 22nd of 2003, which happened to be the 5th anniversary of Disney's Animal Kingdom, the park announced that it would be opening Expedition Everest, Legend of the Forbidden Mountain, for the 2006 season in the park's Asia section. Disney Imagineering had been working on the attraction for years at this point, as they worked meticulously to perfect the ride's story, theming, and overall experience. The attraction was ultimately a Hail Mary attempt at turning Disney's Animal Kingdom's declining attendance around. The ride would be themed around an expedition business named Himalayan Escapes Tour Company located in the foothills of northern India. The company uses refurbished steam trains to send trekkers on various expeditions through the Himalayas. Expedition Everest is the name of a specific trek that travels to the base camp of Mount Everest, but it utilizes a shortcut through the Forbidden Mountain that is thought to be guarded by the Yeti. According to Himalayan folklore, the Yeti is believed to be the fierce protector of the Himalayans' most pristine mountains, valleys, and forests, and violently opposes man's encroachment in these areas. Imagineers took several trips to the Himalayas while designing Expedition Everest. This was done so that designers could properly observe and understand the Nepali culture and architectural style of the Himalayan area, as well as to undercover the myth of the Yeti. The team of Imagineers took their findings and designed them into the new attraction. With the use of clay modeling, the team created 24 different versions of the ride before choosing a design that worked. Some versions featured too large of a mountain that would have been far too expensive to construct. Others featured a design where the roller coaster track exited the mountain multiple times in view of guests, which would tamper with the forced perspective of the artificial mountain and make it look much smaller. So it was decided to shrink the size of the mountain and hide the roller coaster as much as possible. Even so, the mountain would stand at a height of 199.5 feet, or just shy of 61 meters. This placed the mountain just half a foot below Florida's 200 foot height restriction, which requires a blinking red light for aircrafts. The mountain would occupy an area of over one acre, or over 4,000 square meters, with the entire ride occupying over six acres, or over 25,000 square meters. Advancements in computer technology also allowed for designers to scan the clay model of the attraction straight into a digital design program, which helped designers visually see every aspect of the attraction at once, 
and to make any necessary changes without much delay. Overall, this helps shrink the design process down from 3 to 4 years to just 18 months. Alongside Disney Imagineering, ride manufacturer Vacoma also worked with Disney on the Expedition Everest project. Designers incorporated the mythical Yeti into the ride as much as they could, as they really wanted riders to feel its presence as it guarded the Forbidden Mountain. This led to the attraction featuring two direction changes, where the ride would change from traveling forward to backward, as well as backward to forward, as the train attempted to avoid the Yeti and its path of destruction. In fact, at the end of the attraction, riders would ride past an absolutely massive animatronic of the Yeti himself. I'll get more into the infamous Yeti animatronic later in the video. Vertical construction of the ride began to take place as crews began to erect the massive concrete foundation of the mountain, as well as some of the roller coaster's track and supports. One of the coolest things about Expedition Everest is that the structure of the roller coaster and the structure of the mountain are completely separate and do not touch each other. This is because the structure of the roller coaster is dynamic and moves with the load of each train, whereas the structure of the mountain needs to remain rigid due to the carved plaster and rockwork that make up the exterior of the mountain. Looking through the inside of the attraction, you can see just how close the two structures get to each other. The large black supports are what support the coaster track, and the red beams make up the structure of the mountain. The two systems occupy the same space, yet engineers were able to make it work. At no point did the two structures ever come in contact with one another, but in many locations they come in within inches of each other. Construction of the ride would continue as crews erected the massive mountain and roller coaster within, as well as the surrounding village and immense amount of theming accompanying the ride. Overall, the ride required 38 miles, or 61 kilometers of rebar, 10 million pounds, or 4.5 million kilograms of structural steel, and an even more impressive 20 million pounds, or 9 million kilograms of concrete to construct. The enormous Yeti animatronic found toward the end of the ride was also tested and placed inside the Forbidden Mountain. I'll talk more about the troubled Yeti later in the video. Testing of the ride would begin towards the end of 2005, and all seemed to be looking good for Expedition Everest. Overall, it took 6 years to design and build the attraction, and the price tag came in at a whopping 100 million US dollars to design and construct. For over a decade, Expedition Everest would remain the world's most expensive roller coaster ever built. The attraction was nearing completion, and Walt Disney World executives were most likely itching for the ride to open. Everest was a highly expensive gamble to help turn Animal Kingdom into a true all-day park, as the park tended to empty out by the early afternoon. The hope was that Everest would convince more guests to stay in the park longer, and even past dinner time, and also that the ride would simply boost the attendance of Animal Kingdom entirely, which was hovering around 8.2 million visitors at this point. Expedition Everest officially soft opened on January 26th of 2006, and things were already looking good. Based on this report from Mark Goldhaber, who attended one of the early days the ride was soft opened, the attraction already drew in enormous crowds, to the point that the entire parking lot would fill before the park even opened for the day. An absolutely gigantic crowd of guests were waiting for rope drop, and afterwards, pretty much the entire mob made their way to Asia. The crowd then proceeded to completely overflow the standby line, as well as the fast pass distribution line, which stretched over an hour long, almost to the Dinoland Bridge. Well, after a few months of being soft opened, the ride officially opened to the public on April 7th of 2006. Immediately, Guests were stunned by not only the fun and thrilling experience of the roller coaster aspect of the attraction, but just how visually striking the entire ride and surrounding area were. For starters, Disney created a small Himalayan village around the ride that they called Circa Zong. The village was previously occupied by the Royal Anandapur Tea Company, and many of the village's buildings had been repurposed by different businesses that send trekkers on various expeditions through the Himalayas. The experience becomes even more enticing as guests enter the heavily themed queue, which works its way through different buildings in the village and is filled with many props from actual Himalayan villages. At one point, the line heads through a Goomba, which is a type of Himalayan shrine to the Yeti, as well as a makeshift museum that documents Yeti sightings, its significance in Himalayan cultures, and also about an apparent lost expedition that ran afoul of the Yeti while attempting to reach Everest via the Forbidden Mountain Pass in 1982. At the end of the museum are two notices, one from the museum curator warning against railroad expeditions through the Forbidden Mountain, and another from the owner of the expedition company, stating the curator's notice does not represent the opinions or views of the company. Guests arrive into the train station, where they load into the steam locomotives. 34 riders at a time are boarded into each of the ride's trains. 
Each ride vehicle is meant to serve as a steam train that the Himalayan Escapes Tour Company have repurposed as the trains were previously used by the tea company to bring tea leaves down from the mountains. Disney even added a steam effect where the train blows off a big puff of steam as it arrives and departs from the load station. After loading into the train, the trek to the Mount Everest base camp begins as the steam train dispatches out of the load station and toward the first lift hill. The first lift is quite small and gives a great view of the forbidden mountain ahead. The train descends down a small left-hand drop and then up and over a small hill as it continues to turn left. After climbing up another hill, the ride drops into a swooping left turn and approaches the second lift hill. The second lift hill takes riders through a small cavern that holds many artifacts related to the legend of the Yeti. The train continues to climb upward and reaches a maximum height of 112 feet or 34 meters as it enters the white cap of the mountain. The train drops off the lift hill and turns left into a small cavern and then into a section of upward slope track. But the end of this track segment has been ripped apart by the Yeti, creating a dead end. As the train is paused, distant roars of the Yeti can be heard, and danger becomes imminent. The train quickly reverses direction and heads back into the mountain to attempt to escape from the Yeti. The train continues backward into a different segment of track that sends riders spiraling backwards through the pitch dark with some pretty decent speed. The train heads into a passageway that should offer an escape from the mountain, but a shadow of the Yeti is spotted, and it tears apart another piece of track. The train then moves forward through another track switch and escapes the mountain by heading down a large 80 foot or 24 meter drop where the ride hits its top speed of 50 miles per hour or 80 kilometers per hour. The train swoops through a highly banked left turn and then back up into another hill where the train re-enters the mountain through a cavern. The roars of the Yeti can still be heard. The train heads down a right hand curving drop and then emerges from the mountain into a 540 degree upward helix. The train twists around at pretty high speeds and climbs back into the mountain as it races to avoid the Yeti. However, this is pointless as the train heads down a right hand drop and actually flies past the Yeti itself. Riders narrowly escape the Yeti and turn right into the ride's final break run ending the ride. The train exits the Forbidden Mountain and heads back towards the train station that started the ride. While not being the most thrilling roller coaster, Expedition Everest is easily one of the best themed attractions out there. It's an absolute full package of a ride, and Disney's work paid off, as the ride has become a smashing success and is easily one of the most popular attractions at the entire Walt Disney World Resort. The ride helped attendance at Animal Kingdom grow by a record 8.6% during the 2006 season, resulting in an annual attendance of 8.9 million visitors. Attendance would continue to grow in 2007, with the park attracting nearly 9.5 million visitors. One of the coolest parts about Expedition Everest, especially when it opened, and still to this day, are the two changes in direction that occur inside the mountain. The first direction change occurs immediately after the ride's second lift hill, at the broken track scene. Here, the train enters traveling forward, and leaves traveling backward. The second direction change occurs not too long after that, inside the mountain. The train enters a cave in the backward direction and watches the Yeti's shadow as it rips apart more track. The train then leaves the cave in the forward direction and into the ride's main drop. And Disney did an amazing job hiding from guests that these directional changes even occur. While watching the ride, trains simply appear to enter the mountain in the forward direction and head down the large drop while still traveling forward. The direction changes are made possible with massive track switches that roll into different positions and lock into place to allow trains to travel between different segments of track. There is one track switch for the broken track scene and one at the Yeti shadow scene. Each one weighs 200,000 pounds or 91,000 kilograms and are the size of a school bus. While these track switches may not be as fast as the high speed ones found on Haggard's motorbike adventure at Universal, they still move very quickly. Once a train has come to a complete stop, each track switch can unlock from its first position, roll into its second position, and lock into place in just 6 seconds. And all this movement occurs while suspended several stories in the air, unlike the track switches on Hagrid's motorbike adventure that operate closer to ground level. Overall, the track switches are just another example of the amazing engineering put into Expedition Everest. They can cause problems however, and can often throw errors that cause the ride to shut down. But otherwise, they're an engineering marvel. After 15 years of operation, Expedition Everest still remains a major crowd favorite at Animal Kingdom. Therefore, it needs to deliver its high quality riding experience to thousands of visitors each day. So while Imagineers work to perfect the story and experience provided, they also work to make the ride as efficient as possible. 
The ride can run multiple trains on the track at the same time, and does so in a way that you hardly even notice. Taking a look at Expedition Everest, all you see is a beautiful mountain dominating the skyline of Animal Kingdom, with some roller coaster track in between, but in no way are you able to see all the hidden brake runs and other mechanisms that allow the ride to operate at such a high capacity. Compare this to a ride like Hollywood Rip Ride Rocket at Universal Studios Florida, which has multiple visual brake runs scattered around its layout. Disney may not build the most thrilling attractions, but you have to respect their attention to detail. Hidden within the layout of Expedition Everest are different block zones. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of ride that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is the method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is still occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding into one another. Pictured here is the block zone diagram of Expedition Everest. First, we have the load station block zone, then the A-lift block zone, which is the ride's first small lift hill. Then we have the B-lift block zone, which is all of the ride's track after A-lift to the crest of B-lift, or the second lift hill. Following is zone 1, which consists of the drop off B-lift and turn into the broken track scene. Next is zone 2, which consists of the backward section inside the mountain into the cave scene with the shadow of the Yeti ripping apart the track. Then is zone 3, which consists of the large drop out of the mountain, as well as the hill afterwards, and 540 degree upward helix. Zone 3 ends with the brake run that enters the mountain. After is the hold block, which consists of the flyby past the Yeti animatronic, and the following brake run that exits the mountain, and the holding area afterwards right before the unload station. And then finally, the last block is the unload station. Altogether, there are a total of 8 different block zones scattered around the ride. With this block zone set up, the ride was originally designed to run a maximum of 4 trains. With 4 train operations, the ride is able to dispatch a train from the load station every 56 seconds. Theoretically, the ride can cycle 64 trains an hour, and with each train holding 34 riders, a theoretical hourly capacity of 2,176 riders per hour. When running with 3 trains, the dispatch interval is 75 seconds leading to 48 cycles an hour, and an hourly capacity of 1,632 riders per hour. Then with two train operations, the dispatch interval is 99 seconds, leading to 36 cycles an hour, and an hourly capacity of 1,224 riders per hour. Everest would operate with a max of four trains for its first season or two. When running at a perfect four train interval, one train will be cresting the second lift hill as another train is heading down the large drop out of the mountain. This interval is even pictured in the ride's concept art. But even with a capacity of 2,176 riders per hour, this was not enough to satisfy Disney, as Expedition Everest serves as one of Animal Kingdom's headlining attractions. To further boost the ride's capacity, Disney worked with Vekoma to see how they could fit a fifth train onto the track. To make it possible, they took advantage of the ride's variable speed lift motor on B-Lift, which allows it to run at different speeds when necessary. With five train operations, the ride would pretty much always operate with B-Lift in the slower speed, as the lift hill doesn't speed up until the train ahead clears zone 2 and the track switch resets to accept the next train. They also included an odd holding pattern when running 5 trains, I'll explain that in just a second. But with 5 train operations, the ride is capable of dispatching from the load station every 54 seconds leading to 66 cycles every hour, and a theoretical hourly capacity of 2,244 riders per hour. Now here's what is kind of problematic about upgrading a ride originally meant to run 4 trains to 5. The additional train was added to the circuit without adding any additional block zones, so the same 8 block zones as before. In fact, a block zone is kind of removed from the ride anytime it operates with 5 trains. Let me start by explaining the holding pattern of the ride or basically where in the circuit trains will stop if the ride crew were to stop dispatching trains from the station. With four train operations, the ride acts very normally. The first train will stop in the load station, followed by the second in the unload station, and the third train at the hold block, directly before unload. The fourth train will stop in the brake run at the end of zone three, right before the Yeti animatronic. With four trains on the track, it's rare that operations slow down to the point that the fourth train will need to stop at zone three. But when upgrading the ride to 5 train operations, it was feared that slower operations could more easily cause a train to stop in zone 3 due to having an extra train on the track. Having a train consistently stopping in zone 3 would interrupt the flow of the ride, and in the words of Disney, cause a quote unquote bad show. 
Each train is supposed to cruise through Zone 3 and straight into the hold block as it approaches the Yeti animatronic. But in Zones 2 and 1, the train comes to a stop anyway, as it waits for the track switch to change places, and also for the show scenes to take place. So with 5 train operations, if operations slowed down, it was decided to essentially omit Zone 3 as a holding position, and have the 4th train hold at Zone 2 during the Yeti Shadow scene, and the 5th train would then hold in Zone 1 at the Broken Track scene. So this is why it's almost like the ride runs with 7 block zones instead of 8, while running 5 trains. So that when operations slow down due to any reason, trains won't stop unnaturally in Zone 3. Instead, they remain stopped at locations of the ride where trains come to a stop anyway, in this case, Zone 2 and Zone 1. However, here is what is kind of problematic about that. Having the 4th train stop at Zone 2 rather than Zone 3 can be more stressful, as Zone 2 is much earlier in the ride than Zone 3. The train at Zone 2, as well as Zone 1, is only supposed to stop for a few seconds, while the track switch has changed position, and also while the show scene is played. After that, the stop trains are immediately supposed to resume motion so that the experience is perfect. If operations slow down, the 4th train will remain stopped at Zone 2, and possibly the 5th train at Zone 1, longer than they are supposed to. The show scenes will play and end, and the train will continue to awkwardly sit stopped. It's especially noticeable at Zone 2, when the Yeti shadow scene is played. The Yeti will hop away and the scene will end, and the train will continue to sit in place. While this isn't as quote unquote bad of a show, as having trains completely stop at Zone 3, it's still not a good show and Disney requires that the ride experience remain as top-notch as possible. With 5 train operations, a train at Zone 2 would technically need to wait for the train in the hold block to completely exit hold and fully enter the unload block. But this would take far too long, causing the train in Zone 2, and potentially the train in Zone 1, to sit stopped for far too long. So the ride is programmed to allow the stopped train in Zone 2 to enter Zone 3, as long as the train in the unload station is advanced into the load station. This basically guarantees that the train in hold will fully advance into the unload block before the train on the course reaches the end of zone 3, which avoids the need for it to stop. So while zone 3 is not used as a holding position with 5 trains, it's still used as a block zone, but the ride is programmed to avoid having a train stop here. Now while that may not sound that bad, Cast members at Expedition Everest have maybe 4 seconds beyond the 54 second dispatch interval to keep things smooth. I'll explain that in just a second. With 5 train operations, there is almost no buffer time at all if an issue arises. To help cast members with the strict dispatch interval, lanterns are installed on the ceiling of the load and unload station. These lanterns blink red to alert cast members that the dispatch interval is approaching and turn solid red when it's time for the train to leave. The blue lights to the left and right of the red light indicate when attendants on either side of the train have enabled it to dispatch. If the ride crew dispatches trains later than 58 seconds, this will cause a slowdown to the point where the train at zone 2 will need to remain stopped at the Yeti shadow scene longer than it's supposed to, which gives a quote unquote bad show to those riders. The train at the broken track scene may also have to remain stopped for far too long. So this is what becomes problematic about 5 train operations. While it theoretically makes it possible to churn through 68 more riders an hour, it can possibly create awkward pauses at zones 2 and 1 during the show scenes when holdups occur in the station. To make things even worse, if operations slow down by just a few more seconds, the computer will lock the stop trains in place and not allow them to resume motion, and the station will be unable to dispatch more trains. The hold block is the only block zone besides the load and unload blocks where trains can stop for an extended period of time. In all other block zones, trains can only stop for 8 seconds, or else the ride will auto-stop that block zone and prevent further dispatches from the station. In the case of Zone 1 and Zone 2, where trains stop anyway for roughly 10 seconds while the track switch occurs, they cannot remain stopped for 8 seconds beyond the normal amount, or else motion in that block zone is prevented as well as preventing any more trains from dispatching from the station. Now this doesn't cause the ride to break down like Space Mountain or Big Thunder Mountain do at Magic Kingdom, as the main operator at Tower can reset these incidents and have the ride resume motion. But it's still crucial that cast members stick to the 54 second interval while running 5 trains. Things can also get pretty weird if the load station sticks to interval, but the unload station falls behind. Say if a train is dispatched from the load station, but a delay occurs in the unload station. The train and unload will remain stopped, 
This will quickly force the train in Zone 2 to remain stopped at the Yeti Shadow scene, followed by forcing the train in Zone 1 to remain stopped at the Broken Track scene. But now we have another train in motion on the track, the train that was just dispatched from the load station. This train will approach B-Lift and come to a stop at the bottom of it because the ride knows that Zone 1 is still occupied. So trains must also dispatch on time from the unload station or even the train that was just dispatched from the load station won't even be able to continue further than the bottom of B-Lift. Now this train did not always stop at the bottom of B-Lift. Even if Zone 1 was still occupied, the train used to climb B-Lift and stop at the very top instead. When Expedition Everest backs up this far, the trains stop on B-Lift, it can be challenging to restart motion. Sometimes, the ride crew will have to temporarily remove a train, and sometimes, the ride will not allow B-Lift to restart at all. When B-Lift won't restart, guests will need to be evacuated from the stopped train. Because of the issue, Everest was reprogrammed to stop trains at the bottom of B-Lift rather than at the top to make it easier to evacuate guests. Speaking of evacuations, something a few of you may have noticed before is that on the second half of B-Lift, it looks like there is no handrail for the catwalk on the left side of the train. Disney pays so much attention to detail that they didn't want a handrail visible on this section of the lift, so that it looks more like a proper bridge. Now a handrail is absolutely necessary for anyone walking the lift stairs, otherwise they could easily fall over the edge. So the ride has a movable handrail that lowers and hides when it's not needed and will automatically raise into position anytime the ride is emergency stopped or when the ride is powered off. Once the handrail has been raised into place, it must be lowered manually by cast members. Speaking of moving objects, this wouldn't be an Expedition Everest video if we didn't talk about the infamous Yeti animatronic, who for years has gone by the nickname Disco Yeti. One of the most hyped parts of Expedition Everest was the Yeti audio animatronic. When designing the Yeti, Walt Disney Imagineering looked to three different primates for inspiration. The Golden Monkey, the Asian Langer Monkey, and the prehistoric Gigantopithecus. The Yeti stands 25 feet, or 7.5 meters tall, and weighs 8,000 pounds, or about 3,600 kilograms. It's built on its own structure that is separate from that of the mountain and roller coaster. Connected to the Yeti's back is a boom that is attached to the structure which supports the Yeti. The movement is made possible with a horizontal slide, as well as a vertical slide that allow the Yeti to move 5 feet, or about 1.5 meters horizontally, and 18 inches, or 46 centimeters vertically. Powering this movement is a 3,000 PSI, or 21,000 kilopascal hydraulic thruster that can be recharged in just 20 seconds. Covering the Yeti is over 1,000 square feet, or 92 square meters of fur that attach to the animatronic with 1,000 snaps and 250 zippers. The Yeti was designed and first put together in Disney's design studio in California, where after assembly, animators worked diligently to perfect its motion. Afterwards, it was packed up and shipped to Florida, where it was built into the ride. Overall, the Yeti animatronic is one of the most complicated aspects of Expedition Everest and also the most expensive. The Yeti animatronic would function correctly at Expedition Everest for only a few months, as the continuous motion of the animatronic caused the concrete foundation supporting it to fail. It's rumored that a flaw with the computer program used to design Expedition Everest is to blame for that. Once this occurred, the Yeti was switched into B mode, where the figure remains completely still, but bright strobe lights flash the stationary Yeti, making it appear that it's moving as each train passes by. This is how the Yeti has earned the nickname Disco Yeti. The park has actually put additional concrete over the damaged foundation and attempt to band-aid it. They even tried to slow down the motion of the Yeti so that it wouldn't cause any further damage. The Yeti was switched back into A mode following these modifications, where it actually moves. However, this was short-lived as the hydraulic thrusters sprung a leak and began leaking hydraulic fluids. It's said that to this day, the mats used to clean the hydraulic fluid are still unmoved since the original cleanup. And at some point in the process, the Yeti apparently broke its hip, further worsening the situation. And no, the Yeti didn't break its actual hip, but whatever piece of machinery that attaches near its hip location, that broke. Now even though the entire Yeti is a separate structure from the mountain and coaster, the damage done to the animatronic has made it nearly impossible to fix while also keeping Expedition Everest operating. The entire mountain and coaster are built around the Yeti, and to fix it would require dismantling portions of the mountain as well as the roller coaster inside. This would of course necessitate closing Expedition Everest for an extended period. I hear at least 8 months to perform the work necessary. Walt Disney World is open 365 days a year and attracts not only Florida tourists, but literally millions of tourists from all over the world. And with Everest being such an iconic and popular attraction, many tourists come to the resort for it. Disney has thus attempted to keep the ride open as often as possible, basically every single day. 
In fact, Everest has never closed once for any sort of refurbishment. Any repair work that needs to take place is done at night in between operating days. This is pretty uncommon in the theme park industry, even when compared to other Disney parks like the ones in California, as well as the Disney parks in Tokyo, who will close rides when necessary for refurbishments. While Disney World's method may keep Everest operating every day, it has meant that some of the ride's special effects have deteriorated and haven't been fixed. The Yeti is one of them, as well as some other small touches. The trains used to blow a puff of steam when they parked and dispatched in the station. For years, this effect has been used on and off, with it being off most of the time. Not even the famous bird on a stick is always operational. There used to also be a mist effect in the tunnels where the track switches are. Disney stopped using those, however, as it was causing premature rust and corrosion to the ride and also messing with some of the sensors. Joe Rohde has stated many times that he and the Disney team would fix the broken Yeti animatronic. He even mentioned this to a crowd of people at the 2013 D23 Expo. He has also talked about fixing the Yeti multiple times on Twitter. Joe Rohde has since retired from Disney Imagineering and now works at Virgin Galactic as an experienced architect. Going forward, it's unknown whether Disney will close Expedition Everest for any kind of refurbishment at all, especially for the amount of time it would take to fix the Yeti. From a business perspective, it probably doesn't make much sense to close the attraction for 8 months, especially if the ride remains so popular even with the broken animatronic. Our best bet might be years and years from now, when Expedition Everest is in desperate need of a major renovation due to old age and deterioration. But my guess is that we will continue to have Disco Yeti for many years to come. Now while the Yeti animatronic was an unfortunate failure, Expedition Everest is a total smash success and really did help boost Animal Kingdom's overall attendance and performance as a park. After 15 years of operation, the ride remains immensely popular and attracts so many tourists to the Walt Disney World Resort. In my opinion, Expedition Everest is Disney World's best roller coaster and it still puts up some serious competition against Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure at Universal Orlando, even if the ride is 13 years older. As beautiful as the ride is and its theming are, my favorite part of Expedition is how it operates. The requirements to keep the ride operating at such a high capacity with the congested 5 train operations is just mind boggling. And I hope you appreciate just how chaotic Disney is willing to get to ensure that as many people as possible get to enjoy their attractions, even if it means only an additional 68 riders per hour. Also, I should mention that I have Block Zone merch in the all new El Toro Ryan Teespring shop. Check out the link in the description below to browse the different nerdy offerings we have. Anyways, as always everyone, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you learned something new. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.